Hello, everybody. Thank you uh, for coming out. It's pretty early this morning. Um, I'll go through this and uh, hopefully show you and tell you a few new things that you haven't heard before. So real quick, let's just step back and look at a little bit of history on how innovation has worked, uh, specifically in the game market, where hardware really enables new content innovation. A new piece of hardware comes out, developers are able to pick it up, do new things with it, and, uh, and ultimately, their content ends up driving uh, the sales of the new piece of hardware. No content, no hardware sales. So really, developers are at the very crux of the entire uh, ecosystem. They are what's driving um, this great, great new world that we're in um, of visual computing. So let's take a step back and look at 2D, uh, where a lot of this got started in graphics. Uh, it started with some early uh, devices. You can think of on the computing side, uh, you had the Apple II GS, one of the very first PCs with uh, graphics capabilities, uh, pixel capabilities. You also had the Atari 2600. Uh, a few years later, the actual content arrived for the Apple II GS being Space Invaders that really drove uh, sales. So in the early days, there were a few games, but it wasn't until something like Space Invaders, which is one of the very first uh, million unit sellers, uh, that the console actually took off. You had the Apple II GS, and there you had Ultima, which arrived, and of course, Ultima was one of the first RPGs out there. Uh, a lot of us had lost a lot of hours on this game. Um, but again, this was pixels changing on the screen, and it was really static backgrounds with small numbers of pixels changing for characters and things like that. Uh, you then had Nintendo, which did something pretty incredible. Uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1983 arrived, but many people don't remember that it was the first game on the Nintendo was Mario Brothers, was again a static background where just a few characters were changing, um, and it re resembled a lot like Donkey Kong in, in the uh, uh, arcade. And it wasn't until 1985 that Super Mario Brothers arrived, and this kicked off an entire new wave of visual computing being side-scrolling games. And I mean, literally for almost a decade, we had incredible side-scrolling games. Then came 3D, and this was just such an, an amazing uh, part of my life. I remember uh, the very early days of 3D, um, led by no, none other than John Carmack, who introduced us to Doom, which was the first 2.5D game. It wasn't full 3D, but it was just the first glimpse of where 3D was really going to be able to go on the personal computer. You then had a great company, Sony, which I think we just heard a lot about, uh, introduced the PlayStation um, just a year later, and they introduced a very unique thing on the hardware side, which was the gamepad had two analog sticks, and those analog sticks were designed uh, to enable looking around a 3D environment. And so a few years later, you had one of those holy grail titles that arrived that really helped drive the console, which was something I stared at the backside of this for a long time. I think many people did as well, um, and it was awesome. But you don't remember what it actually looked like. Um, I remember it looking a whole lot better than these pixels. And this, again, this was a little bit of a 2.5D experience. It wasn't full 3D until, again, Carmack brought us Quake. And this was the first time we had, you know, kind of perspective corrected and full 3D. You could go above things and below things, and it was just a really magical experience. Um, so many days of my life lost on Quake, and uh, in almost college lost on Quake. It was very fun. Almost that same year, uh, literally, you know, within a few months, you had the first 3D GPU. This 3DFX Voodoo was actually designed heavily to run Quake. I mean, literally, this piece of hardware showed up just to run this single game. This is where I think software and Carmack went out there and actually pushed on hardware a little bit. And he said to the you know, GPU guys, why don't you add this kind of software rasterization into the GPU? Uh, 3DFX was one of the very first to do it. And so began the GPU uh, race, which was just incredibly exciting. So 17 years later, we now have almost photorealistic games. I mean, the gaming today is just brilliant. It's awesome. So looking back, you know, what about the hardware? Where are we today with hardware? 
The PC, well, we've picked up a mouse right around the time we got Doom, we, we picked up a mouse, and uh, with the screens got thinner, the computer got faster, um, it's still a keyboard, it's still a screen, 2D screen, it's still a box, uh, it actually largely looks the same as it did in 1977, we did get a mouse, which is great, but it's a whole lot faster and higher resolution. On the console side, screens got bigger, they got thinner, higher resolution, the box got faster, uh, but if you look back to PlayStation 1, the controller, well, I think Sony in introduced a share button, that's awesome, but it's kind of the same, um, and you also had uh, Microsoft who introduced, kind of got bold and introduced a, uh, a motion controller device. I'm not sure developers know what to do with this yet, uh, but it is going to be a big part of the future, we think, and Microsoft uh, is kind of betting on it. We'll see where that goes. Uh, something else very exciting happened in 2007 uh, when Jobs introduced one of the first smartphone, touchscreen phone computing devices, which literally put a computer in your pocket. And this has obviously changed the world, but unfortunately, it's just not very immersive. I mean, it is a five inch screen, maybe it's a four and a half inch screen. I think if you can handle one of those notes, you're at a, almost a six inch screen, which is hard to even put in your pocket. So, you know, it's, but it's not immersive. It's not that kind of immersive gaming that we're used to on the 2D screen on, on something like a PC monitor or a console. So where are we going next? Where does this all kind of, what's coming? I think developers and gamers have really been looking for something new for quite a while. I know I've been excited for something new. Something's got to break on this and we've got to get a new experience. Uh, we really do believe it's finally the time for virtual reality to be that new experience. And this is a motion controlled uh, display that really renders everything correctly, all in the right place. Uh, and again, VR has been imagined for so many years, but it's finally ready. It's fine, hardware is finally there. And we were fortunate enough to be one of the first companies. Um, Sony with HMD was not, this is not uh, virtual reality. Some people think, well, what about Sony's thing? Uh, that's not virtual reality. That is a, literally a TV stuck to your face. Uh, it doesn't have motion control. Um, it can be an interesting experience. Um, maybe for a plane, maybe for a small audience, uh, but it's not VR, not to be confused with. Google's doing some really awesome stuff on the glass, but that's also really not virtual reality. That's projected reality. I mean, many people, when I say it's augmented reality, go, no, it's not even augmented reality, it's projected reality. It's this thing up in the corner of your eye. It's not gonna give you uh, Call of Duty or Battlefield or some incredible experience. We believe that Oculus is the first wide field of view, uh, virtual reality, kind of taste of virtual reality um, that the market has been able to see, that the consumer market has been able to really get a hold of. Um, sometimes internally we, we kind of joke that the de developer kit that we've been shipping is kind of like Doom. It's kind of halfway there. It's not really all the way there. It's, it's, uh, it's only three degrees of freedom and you really need more than that to have the full VR experience, and I'll go into that in a bit. But it's been, it's been very exciting. I mean, people put on the Oculus, and we joke that uh, they, they instantly make the Oculus face. And it's kind of this, oh my God moment. Um, this really works. I'm in the game, this is incredible. So why don't we bring up Aaron Davies. We're gonna do a quick live demo, and Aaron's gonna jump in uh, Unreal Engine 4, this is one of the most modern, cutting edge engines out there. Uh, so he has now stepped into the Elemental demo, you've probably seen this demoed uh, by Sony and a number of other people on modern next gen consoles. Aaron is now actually in this experience. So what he's seeing is fully immersive, it feels like he's really there, he's floating around, uh, 360 degrees, he can look up, he can look down, I mean he literally just went into the elemental world. He is no longer here at the conference. Aaron, you can come back to the conference. If you want. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. So the way that this works is internally inside of this headset, there's a screen and kind of the magic of, of what makes a lot of this possible, frankly, is mobile devices. Um, it's actually the mobile screen that we were able to use and put inside of the headset. Mobile screens are getting you know, higher resolution all the time. They're getting better quality. Uh, they're also 
pretty inexpensive considering they're made in the literally hundreds of millions of units these days. Uh, so inside you have a, a cell phone screen tilted on its side, uh, so in landscape mode, and you have a left and right eye being rendered. Now, I'll dive in a little bit on the tech side here. Uh, this starts to be awfully GPU intensive. So the rendering of VR is really going to bring uh, modern GPUs to, to their knees, especially as the resolution goes up. If you, if you know about the developer kit that we first shipped, it's 1280 by 800. So you got 1280 by 800, sounds like a low resolution. And when you look at it, it kind of looks low resolution. Uh, unfortunately in V, or fortunately for, for uh, AMD and some of the GPU guys, uh, in VR, you have to do an awful lot of extra computing to really make this work. For one thing, you have to render in stereo, so you have to render two complete views. You can't do tricks, you can't fake stereo 3D, you have to really render it twice. One for the left eye, one for the right eye. You also need to do super sampling. You actually need to render the image a little bit bigger so that you can get the full field of view and you g eliminate aliasing. You also have to do full screen MSAA. You need to do 4X MSAA often. So now you have super sampling, you have uh, full screen MSAA, you're rendering at a higher resolution, and at the end, you have to do a full screen shader over the whole interface, uh, the whole screen, to do the distortion. The lenses have some distortion built into them. We use pixel shaders to go and vertex shaders to um, counteract that distortion and correct for it. Uh, also chromatic aberration, so you have this not too expensive, but fairly complicated pixel shader that has to run over the whole scene. Uh, you add all of that up, it's awfully taxing. What Aaron just stepped in is the HD prototype. We've now taken the resolution from 1280 by 800 to 1920 by 1080 for the full screen. Imagine that in stereo, super sampled with 4X M MSAA. I mean, this is pushing the limit of what any modern GPU can do today. And the resolution's only gonna continue to go up. Cell phone screens are continuing to get higher resolution. We're gonna continue to push for higher resolution in the headset. It really makes a difference. Uh, somewhere in the far future, not to be quoted that we're coming out with this today, uh, you'll get resolutions in the you know, 8K, 12K, where it'll start to kind of plateau out in terms of what you can visually see. That's not today, that's far into the future, but you can imagine the kind of GPU you're gonna need as this uh, continues to improve and increase. So we're just getting started with VR and it's already bringing today's GPUs to their knees. Looking a little bit deeper into how this works to really get this experience comfortable for everybody, um, let's take a look at the path of motion to photons. So when you put the headset on and you move around, you're creating this motion. This motion is being read in by sensors. Uh, today there's a gyroscope in there, there's gonna be you know, optical tracking and cameras that we're adding for positional tracking and things like that over time in the future. So you're reading these sensors, you're sending down the sensor data over USB. There's about a millisecond of time it takes to send it down over USB. Uh, it then goes into the game engine. The game engine, let's say at best, we're running at 60 FPS. How many games have a locked 60 FPS today? Not that many. Well, we need it at least 60 FPS today um, to really have this be a great experience. So you have that locked 60 FPS. That adds another 16 milliseconds. 60 FPS is 60 milliseconds per frame. So you get the sensor data, you recalculate for the new view, you now have your new thing to render, you push that out to the GPU, it gets rendered, it then gets sent to the display. Well, when it gets sent to the display, it's scanning out and it's filling out the rows or columns. To fill out the entire display takes about 60 hertz, 60 millisecond, uh, 16 milliseconds. So now we're at 32, 33, 34 with this loop. Uh, we then go and have to actually look at, many people don't think about this, but the pixel switching time. So an LCD per pixel to go from orange to brown or from red to, to green actually takes another 12 to 16 milliseconds. So if you add all of that up, by the time you've moved to get the new image to actually, the photons to hit your eye, you're at around 50 milliseconds. And that is the dev kit that we're shipping today is around 40, 50 milliseconds from motion to photon. If you have any stalls in your game, I think uh, Carmack just recently sent me an email. I said, you know, do you have any comments for the keynote? And he said, uh, you know, make sure that you let everybody know uh, when you're moving your head, you have to have that locked 60 FPS. If you drop a frame, he said, you know, dropping a frame while moving your head feels like somebody hit you in the temple. Uh, it's not a great experience. So you really have to have this locked and you have to get this down. But 50 milliseconds, again, if you're familiar with the developer kit, how many people have tried 
the Oculus Developer Kit. Anywhere, any, all right, a few of you. The rest of you should go try it today. Um, what you will try today in the HD prototype is 50 milliseconds. And what you'll see is when you're moving around, this ends up having a persistence problem where the whole scene kind of smears because you're getting these uh, pixels that are switching and as soon as it starts switching the columns, the, the pixels themselves have the 16 mi millisecond switching time, so they're rising from or, or falling from one color to another, and as you're moving around, everything smears together. And so it's kind of VR is smearing around until you stop, and then it looks good, and then you smear over here, and then it looks good, so you get this incredible motion blur. Well, that's just not good enough for the mass market. That's not gonna be good enough for consumers. So what we're really looking at internally for the future is to actually deliver a much faster experience. What we're looking at is delivering something on the order of 15 milliseconds, less than 20. Uh, but seven to 15 is kind of the holy grail of where you wanna lie, and that was quoted by Abrash. I think Carmack came out and said less than 20 is gonna be uh, good enough, and Abrash said it really needs to be between seven and 15, and this is awfully hard to do. Um, when I first started and got into Oculus and being a programmer and kind of understanding how this worked, I didn't think we were gonna see this so fast. Uh, we now have internal prototypes inside of Oculus. Uh, Valve also has internal prototypes at, at Valve that they've been working with us on uh, r and where we are able to reach this kind of performance. And the experience is magical. It literally changes everything. You go into VR in the future, you'll go into VR, there will be no pixel smearing, there will be no motion blur, it will be very comfortable, you'll literally get this latency, will be a checked off, solved solution. We're not there yet today, but it's coming very quickly. So how do you do that? You have to go in, again, it's one millisecond on the sensor, but you gotta get that game engine running, what, 500 frames per second, 1,000 frames per second? Probably not, that's probably not realistic. It's, we're already having a hard time at 60 FPS, but there are some tricks you can do, leave it again to game developers to do some tricks. There are tricks you can do to actually get the game time separated and to run much, much faster. So what you do is you separate your game thread from your rendering thread, and you now have your rendering thread that's locked at the same frame rate, refresh rate, as the screen. So the, game, the rendering thread may end up having to be 80, 85, 90 FPS, while the game itself could run slower. And then you can do some things like time warping where you read the sensor in the beginning, you update the game to be the new view. The rendering thread, meanwhile, is asking the game thread for the last scene, and it keeps grabbing the last scene, and when it sends that scene to the screen, it keeps reading the sensor, and as it continues to read the sensor, it warps the image into where it really is supposed to be. So it's not truly getting there, but it's tricking your eyes there, and it really is a great experience. You then have the display side. You still have to fill up these columns, it's still fairly slow to fill up these columns. So we're, you know, somewhere around 11 milliseconds is about an 80 to 85, maybe 90 uh, hertz refresh rate, um, which is very important to get it, not 60, but actually more like 90. And then you have your pixel switching time, which unfortunately LCD is just not gonna cut it to be 11, 12 milliseconds. You really need to get, to get it down to less than one. So you can probably guess there's this other very exciting display technology out there that luckily does have a pixel switching time less than one millisecond, which is OLED. So we've been internally R&Ding this. Um, we have gotten this down. It's very exciting uh, with the work that we've done, the work that Valve's done. You literally can get this to run at this incredible rate where it feels comfortable. This now starts to be awfully taxing on the computer. This needs modern computing when you do things like add in cameras and optical tracking to get your position data because orientation is not good enough. You also need your position translation data. You have to do that typically with optical tracking. You're now taking camera data in and you're trying to do all of this at the same time that you're now eating up CPU using uh, for, for decoding the sensor data of the camera and getting the translation there. So this is just the beginning. Today we're just really focusing on vision and already we're starting to really hit the limits of the CPU and GPU today. Imagine when we add more cameras and we try to get your hands in the game. Uh, one of the first experiences when people put it on, they make the Oculus face, oh my gosh. And then the second thing they do is go, huh, where's my hand? Where's my body? You know, when am I gonna see this? And it's like, patience, it's good enough, 
Aren't you amazed at how good, you know, put your hands down and look around. Uh, but you do, you want to see your hands. You're going to want eye tracking. You're going to want mouth tracking. You're going to want, I mean, you really do want to be fully immersed in the game. It's not going to happen for V1. Probably not going to see our hands for V1. But it is going to come, and every time we add that new camera to do some new tracking, every time we add a new sensor, we're going to be coming back to the CPU needing more computing power. We're going to be coming back to the GPU every time we increase the resolution, wanting more resolution. So we largely believe that VR is going to reignite a lot of the kind of CPU, GPU race um, that has in some ways slowed down and kind of plateaued on 2D screens. VR is going to get it going again. So we're bringing out the Oculus Rift. Can't tell you when yet, um, but it, we are making it better. We really want to get this right. If you don't get it right, many of you will be sick. So you want to get it right. You want us to get it right. With the Oculus, you're going to be able to go in and explore user-generated worlds. It's going to be incredible. Uh, there's already some, some mods to make Minecraft work. I think it's called Minecraft. Uh, it's very exciting. You're going to be able to get in cockpits and really feel like you're truly in the cockpit itself. Uh, we showed Hawken for the first time at GDC. People were running to the booth. It was just an awesome experience to see. You're going to be able to see scale and height for the first time. You can look up. And one of the best experiences we have in the prototype internally that now has everything dialed in with the you know, super low latency and the positional tracking and everything there is just literally floating through this kind of space world. And you can float through it for maybe not hours, but you can th float through it for a long time. Not even doing anything, just floating, being amazed at the sense of scale. You're going to be able to look up at monsters and be totally terrified of these incredible monsters for the first time. I haven't really been that terrified on a 2D screen before. You will be terrified in VR, and it will be incredibly exciting. You'll also, something that we haven't really spoken that much about in the past, you will engage with players. You will engage with both multiplayers, you'll engage with bots. For the first time, you'll make eye contact, and when you're moving around, they're going to follow your eyes, you're going to follow them. I mean, you're going to emotionally feel like you're really there, and emotion is going to be a very big part of VR. So, without further ado, we're very happy to show one of the first made-for-VR games. This was originally done by five uh, developers inside of CCP. They picked up Unity. Um, they, on their own free time, made this tech demo. They took it to EVE Fan Fest. It got very, you know, a lot of people liked it. Then they took it to uh, E3. They won more awards than I think almost any PC game has won in an awful long time that's literally just PC, uh, made for PC right now. Um, I don't know where they're going to take it in the future. Um, but they showed it off with the Oculus Rift, EVR. Uh, let's see the trailer. high production made for VR game. Many, many more will come. It's an absolutely incredible experience. A lot of the press said it was one of the best experiences or the best they've seen in nearly a decade. So we are incredibly excited to have CCP so engaged on this. There's hundreds of other VR games being made. Many of them are being made by indies because it's a relatively new platform. But people are exploring this new uncharted territory. It's just an awesome place to be. Virtual reality is finally here. We've all imagined it for so long. It literally is arriving now, and it is going to change the world. It's also going to need an awful lot of computing. Thank you. And for more information, you can go to, I did remember my links. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Great. That Thank you. Great. Hey, Brendan, wait, don't, don't go anywhere just yet. Don't go anywhere just yet. Thank you so much. That was uh, excellent. Thank so, you. So we'll have time, I think, maybe for one or two 
questions? Sure. You still, okay. you still up for that? Yep. So like we did yesterday, um, we have team members in the audience with microphones. If you guys have a question for Brendan, for Oculus VR, we'd love to take them right now. Any questions? Hands up and I'll, I'll send a mic your way here in the front row. Hi, I'm uh, Tara Nair from uh, Tom's Hardware. So I had the pleasure to um, check out the um, Oculus demo at the Experience Zone today. And the only real question I have is, um, when can we get a version that I can wear over my glasses? That is a very good question, glasses. Uh, especially for a lot of the hardcore gamers, which we've all burned out our eyes on the monitor. Uh, we are working on supporting glasses and supporting people who have nearsightedness uh, and farsightedness, so it is something that's at the top of the priority list. We'll have to uh, let you know more in the future, but you'll definitely, it'll definitely be there. That's as much as I can say that's today. Much, okay, I think we've we're got, working yes. on it. I wear glasses too. Okay, uh, yes, David, I think we all do on the stage so, right now, uh, over here. So one of the things you emphasized was that you really need to hit uh, 60 frames per second in order to have a smooth experience, and sometimes even higher. Uh, would you say that the key is actually the frame rendering latency? Because that seems to be what you're going for and that you really want to squeeze that, you know, as low as you can go. Yeah, there are a number of aspects to latency. Again, it's this full loop of motion to photon. So you get uh, the sensor data in, um, then you have your game ticking, which is at 60 FPS to update the scene to be in the new, bright, you know, correct perspective. Um, that's one part of the latency. That's at 60 FPS. The faster you can make that, the better. Really what you want to do is actually get on the rendering side, you're probably going to want it more at 80 or 90 FPS to update to the, the uh, screen. You're also going to want to take the screen and remove the persistence. So the persistence of if you move your head and you, know, you can move pretty fast, you can cover a lot of degrees very fast. If this image is sitting on your face for 30 milliseconds while you're moving, the whole world is going to drag with you until it gets updated. That doesn't feel so good. Now, LCDs actually kind of hide that by blurring the whole thing while you move, and you don't see how much of the scene is actually dragging on your retina until it's updated with the new position. Um, with low persistence, where you actually have the screen, you turn off the screen for most of the time. So most of the uh, view when you're in the headset, if you looked at it with a high-speed camera, it's mostly black. It's literally mostly turned off. You then only are turning it on for one or two milliseconds when the image is exactly in the right place and you can update. And you can even kind of strobe across. And we're doing all kinds of R&D on trying to figure out how to remove that latency, that persistence of how long the image persists on your eye incorrectly. You only want it to be on your eye correctly and then be black and then get a correct image and then get a correct image. And that makes a much more comfortable experience if you run fast enough. If you run at 60 blinking, we're back to kind of the staring at the old CRTs blinking at 60 hertz, and it can, the flicker can be pretty painful. So you do need this high frame rate to get there. Great. Sorry, so you're looking at around uh, 10 milliseconds, ideally, for uh, rendering latency. You know, you'd like to be updating to your eye, uh, strobing across somewhere around 10, every 10 milliseconds, you get a new image, but that image that you get is only gonna be given to you in one to two millisecond chunks. So you're only, it's only gonna be flashed for one millisecond while it's correct, and then it's gonna be turned off while it's not correct, so you don't drag this world with you. It, it's, uh, I think Michael Abrash is gonna be, uh, and Oculus, uh, both Valve and Oculus, are gonna be talking an awful lot more about this uh, in the future, and, and uh, there'll be, again, more information is coming if you check out those blogs uh, over the next couple weeks to months as we really expose how a lot of this is starting to work. Excellent, excellent. Okay, Brendan, let's end on that note. Yep. I really appreciate you taking a little extra time for Q&A and for being here. How about another round of applause? Thank you for Brendan and Oculus Thank you, VR. guys. Yep. Thank you.